Welcome to Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Issues and Answers is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. And now, Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Welcome to the program. I'm Diane Kinderwater. We know there's a presidential election. We know that because we see it all the time on TV, on the radio, we see it every, everywhere. But also, there's a lot of other seats that are up for election. Of course, we know our state legislature, the entire legislature, but there's also some local seats that are up, like our Bernalillo County Commission. And that's very important because the closer the seat is to our lives, the smaller it is, the more impact it has on our direct lives. So we're here at uh, Issues and Answers, very proud to be able to interview a number of the candidates. We've invited all of them, uh, as many as we can, mainly from the Bernalillo County, to come to be an, uh, as our guests. Those who have uh, accepted our invitation are our guests. And I'm proud to introduce you today to Frank Baca. He is a, a general practitioner attorney mostly retired and also had a lot of other positions here in the state of New Mexico regarding law. And he's running for Bernalillo County District 2. So after this break, we're going to meet Frank Baca. You probably know him. You probably know him. He's been doing a lot of things, largely in the South Valley, but also throughout the state of New Mexico. So we're going to meet Frank Baca right at this. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program. I have Frank Baca with us. And you probably know him, but he is looking for the seat held right now by Stephen Michael Casada. You may have seen him in Breaking Bad or maybe on his TV commercials for his new uh, comedy show. But we have someone who wants to take his, take his seat because he's no longer going to run. That's correct. And that's Frank Baca. Thank you so much, Frank Baca. Not big feet to, sh to fill, but some... Some well-known person, but you're also very well-known in the South Valley here in Burley Up County. Uh, well, uh, um, thank you, Diane, first of all, for having me here on, on your program. I've lived in the South Valley all my life. I've lived uh, essentially all my life, a few years elsewhere, but for the most part, I've lived there all my life. So I've been living there for a long time, and as I'm getting older, yeah, I've got to meet a lot of people over the years. A lot of different things. So. Yeah. Again, enough about Stephen Michael Casada. We see enough of him. Now it's all about you and that you have a number of awards, uh, outstanding uh, community service in the South Valley. Don't be shy. Tell us about some of the awards that you've been named. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Well, I mean, I've been involved in the community since, really since uh, I was in a, uh, I guess in law school in my early adult years. I've been involved in lots of different projects and initiatives and programs. Um, and it's kind of something that I just do, something I in, enjoy doing, something I've been involved with. And so the South Valley um, Pride Day offers a, an, an annual acknowledgement of service, community service. And so I received that once before. I've been involved in activities through the State Bar of New Mexico, and I received some uh, recognition from them over the years as well. Well, so, I think one was the top 25 attorneys in New Mexico by the New Mexico Business Weekly is one as well. Right. I was working for the New Mexico Gaming Control Board at the time as their general counsel. And uh, yeah, I was very, uh, very uh, humbled and, and pleased to, to be acknowledged for the work as a general counsel for a state agency. But, you know, it's just a matter of doing your job and, and bringing, uh, you know, hard work and eth work ethic to, you know, to what you do every day and, and try to do the best job you can. And well, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of good things in this community. So, yeah, I was... And you want to continue to be a part of them as one of the five county commissioners in Bernalillo County. Exactly. Your seat is, the seat is open now and you're running for that. Um, Correct. Tell me a little bit about your family. Well, because I read about you and it's pretty interesting. Well, born and raised in the South Valley uh, on the Sledder Boulevard, Southwest. Um, my sister and I still own the property uh, where we were born and raised. I went to uh, public school in that area. I graduated from Rio Grande High School, uh, Project Rio Grande Raven. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I grew up there and, and I've lived in the South, as I indicated, pretty much my entire life. I had a chance to go to school back east. I went to Yale undergrad and got a degree in history. And after that, I went to University of Mexico Law School and graduated from there. Oh, okay, we're stopping at Yale. <laughs> something I don't get to say in this program very often as well. I have a guest who graduated from Yale. I, it was a great uh, experience uh, going back east, kind of a culture shock coming from, you know, high school to an Ivy League institution. But it was, yeah, it was a great experience and, and uh, I, I enjoyed it. But 
Wait, I'm, wait, 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 oh boy. How did you get into Yale? Well, uh, I don't know. I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I wondered that myself, how they, how they uh, let me in. But uh, uh, actually, I mean, good grades, good ATC scores, ACT scores. What do you think? Well, I think it was a combination of things. I had fairly decent uh, grades. I had a fairly decent uh, um, standardized test scores. Um, and I had a friend that I'd known since the third grade that he was also interested. Actually, he was interested before I was in applying to Yale for some reason. And he encouraged in, uh, me to apply. And uh, so we both did. We both were accepted and we both went and, and uh, graduated. And uh, yeah, it, it was, um, it was, you know, I think Yale prides itself on, on diversity and uh, and I think we brought some different, you know, experiences to the campus. And, and was, why it's a little bit, I think, the current uh, candidate for vice president, J.T. Vance, I just read his book uh, yes. for, about Yale. That's why when I read about you going to Yale, that's why it stuck up, stuck, yeah, stuck up yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't read his book, but I know he is a graduate. And, uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, you know, experience with people from all over the country, all over the world, and all sorts of backgrounds. And so it was, yeah, it was interesting. It was a lot of fun. But after being back east in Yale and Ivy League school, you decided to come home. Oh, I was ready to come back home. Oh. I, I was more than willing and ready to come back home. Don't tell them the secret, right? I've been out east. It's like, we don't want to tell them about the land of a jacket too <laughs> Exactly. Much, you know, right? that is so true. Yeah. And, and I think that was kind of, we were kind of a novelty to a lot of people. You're from New Mexico. I've you know, it was kind of a mysterious uh, destination. But then them. going to Yale is kind of mysterious to us as well. Correct, yeah. But I came back, and I was just talking to uh, some friends of, uh, about this over the weekend, uh, that my mother had some serious medical issues at that time uh, and kind of ne needed for me to be back home in Albuquerque, so I came back. And uh, But you were willing and really eager to come back. Oh, I was ready to come back to New Mexico. I mean, uh, this is my home. This is where I was born, where I was raised. and I mean, I love... New Mexico, the land of enchantment, and I like to travel within the state. And a couple of weeks ago, we were camping up north, and you know, just hiking up throughout the mountains of New Mexico. It's a beautiful state. I mean, it's a spectacular place. But so a lot of our kids leave New Mexico. That's correct. That's correct. There are issues in terms of job opportunities. The issue in terms of quality of education, and and you know, I tell people then that um, we have to be. We're not afraid of our challenges. We have to acknowledge what are our strong points and what are the assets of this community, which are many. But we also have to be realistic about our challenges and just face them head on. And I don't think that we do any good by, by trying to paint a rosier picture than there is. We have some issues and challenges in regards to education, job opportunities. And I think uh, overall, you know, the state is, is, is working hard to address those issues. I've had some ideas myself that I thought I could contribute, uh, you know, to the conversation. So, so yeah, let's just be honest about you know the assets, but also the deficits, and uh, and uh, do what we can as a community to work together and solve problems and, and change. What do you think of this? Of course, when I imagine when you're on the commission, it's not just District Two that you're going to represent. This Correct. Is your area. Actually, first tell me where what are the boundaries more or less for District Two? Uh, basically, south of Central Avenue and south west of Central. Okay. south of Central, and west of I twenty five, all the way to the county lines in both areas. It goes south to Isleta Pueblo, and then uh, west all the way to the Bernalillo, end of the Bernalillo County line. Yeah, so it's a good sized district. Yeah. Now, when we speak of Central, of course, that's perhaps East Central. It's a little precarious. People well, don't want to drive on it. People don't want to go there, and maybe a little bit south as well. Sure. Yeah, Central uh, Avenue, uh, uh, d downtown west uh, on, of cent on Central. And, uh, yeah, there are definitely some issues and challenges uh, along Central, up and down. And, again, those are something we just have to face. There are issues and there are problems and there are concerns. And I think we as a community have to be realistic about those issues, not hide uh, from them and just, you know, just have a conversation about the issues and start looking for, you know, for solutions as a community. Why did you decide to run for county commission? Well, I ran four years ago uh, unsuccessfully and uh, I also ran like 30 years ago when I was, when I was young and I uh, didn't win then. And again, I'm retired now, essentially retired, and I had the, the time, and I have a lot of involvement, the history of involvement in the community. And I see running for office, uh, this particular office, is sort of a culmination of my 
uh, my community activities. It's just something that I, I, I miss, this may be kind of strange, but I'm one of the few people that actually enjoys community meetings. I don't, I don't regret having to do that. I, I look forward to them. In fact, I get bugged sometimes when I find out about a meeting that I didn't know about. And I think, mm -hmm. why didn't somebody tell me I would have gone if I would have known about it? So I enjoy that engagement. I enjoy the interaction with people and always have in, in the community meeting type of settings. And I think that's where it starts to make, where you have to start, is you have to go out to the community and listen to people. So do you think, how have you seen the South Valley and Albuquerque and Albuquerque change? I mean, you're a lifelong resident. Disappointed about the change? Well, there's been good changes and not so good changes. I mean, there's some growth going on in, in, in Albuquerque. And yeah, that's an interesting point, Dan. I was thinking about that because in the South Valley, what I call the South Valley floor, the traditional historic area of the South Valley, which is kind of between Coors Road and the river, again, going south from downtown central all the way to Soto Pueblo, it's a very old historic community. People have been living there for hundreds of years. And there is some reluctance to see change. I mean, it's people oftentimes, you know, have lived in the same house well, sure. that they were born in, and or and 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 there's some reluctance to to change. Well, because it was good <laughs> back then in the right. day. That's right. why I believe people don't want to see change because exactly. it was good 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Semi-rural communities you know, families, community sense of, of community with families that know each other and grew up with each other. Uh, the Southwest Mesa area is, is a more traditional suburb of Albuquerque. Uh, there's not the same emotional attachment to their homes or the area they live. They, it's a, mm -hmm. a place for them to live and that's a very different and dynamic community with a lot of growth. I think people there are not resistant to change. I think they So you want, represent that as well? That you is represent correct. that as well. That's correct. The southwest part of the west side. That's correct. So what are you looking you liked attending the meetings of such, but what are you looking to do? You said to listen to people. You've listened. What what are they saying to you? Yeah, that's 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 a good way to look at it because I have tried to listen and heard the different issues in the different communities. And in the South Valley, as I call the South Valleys, uh, uh, distinct from the Southwest Mesa, a big concern is basic infrastructure. There's residential roads that need attention. There's drainage issues. There's a desire for additional parks and recreational facilities. Uh, those are, the, and, and I would like to put in a plug for some of our legislative de uh, delegation present and past. I think there's been a good group of people in there that have really done well in terms of bringing funding to the area with our major arteries, Bridge Boulevard is being reconstructed, Sleta Boulevard is being reconstructed, Rio Bravo is being reconstructed. Oh, wow. So there's some major projects that are underway as we speak. But there has been a lot of money though too in the there's legislature. There's a lot of money A lot of money for the taxpayers are paying. Correct. That is correct. Oil and gas industry is paying, that so is there correct. is money to be put to infrastructure. And that sometimes people say public safety, the job of government is safe, you know, public safety, correct. keeping the country or the state community safe and also building the roads and the bridges. So that's something, again, our taxes are paying for, so it's good to see that they're being put in. I didn't realize all those streets are receiving attention. The major projects, and, and you're absolutely right. We traditionally have seen ourselves as a poor state, but the last three years, we've had 3.5 billion of new money, and they tell me that they expect that to continue for the next three to five years at least, so that's... And why do we have this money? It's oil and gas oil revenue, and gas. absolutely, and so... 3.5 new dollars. 3.5 billion, with a B. I mean, that's to me, is, is mind-boggling. So, we should be seeing a lot of the new infrastructure, hopefully, but absolutely. you're seeing it. Absolutely. What else are people saying to you? Well, again, in some areas, it's, it's going to be different in yeah. different areas. I mean, Borales is another very, and, and South Broadway. There's some old, uh, more urban communities where the South Valley are, is old and more semi-rural. So they have their own issues and concerns. On the Southwest Mesa, again, it's more suburban, traditional suburban. There's a lot of concern about, uh, again, the, the, the traffic more in terms of speeding in terms of basic uh, public safety issues and, 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 and crime uh, is certainly an issue in some communities. And uh, they are not hesitant to, to grow. They, they definitely want Southwest to Mesa. Southwest Mesa. Is that Mesa. where the baseball fields are? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, uh, anything west of Coors 
and south of Central is okay. what I would refer to as Southwest Mesa. And it's a you know, large area with a lot of room to grow and a lot of development. There's new housing. That's and probably about the only area in New Mexico. I think you're right. I think you're right. right? We got the time. mountains and yeah. then we got the Indian, uh, the got, Native American reservations. Sure, and then I think of the Southwest Mesa That's goes. Where the, yeah. If you're ever on I-40 driving out there, you know. That's exactly right. There's room to grow and develop. We have a lot of industry now, a lot of warehouses and things along. Yeah. That section as well. That is true. And that, a lot of that, or most of it, I would say, is probably north of Central Avenue in the adjoining uh, oh, district. Just in which district? district? Uh, I think that would... Uh, yeah, but uh, that's... I'm not sure the, the okay. number of that. I think it's district... Uh, I'm not sure. I don't want to... Uh, but north of Central, yeah. That, well. That's where I've seen it. Amazon, for example, yeah. So the folks back there on the Mesa want what? They want the safety, security, infrastructure. What are they? Parks. What do they want? The parks. They also want businesses. They want restaurants. They want retail shopping. They want access to the basic, you know, commercial and retail outlets that you find in other parts of the city. And so I've talked to a lot of the people that are very active out there, and, and that has come up. They want to see shopping centers. They want to see growth. They want to see development in their area. They don't want to have to drive a long ways after work to do basic shopping and find good restaurants. But what can a county commissioner do to, to help that? Well, I think one of the things you can do, again, is to be present, to be available, to speak with people about what they want to do, and to, uh, you know, bureaucracy can be really good because it does the basic mechanics of, of government, but sometimes it can get in the way of getting things done. And I don't think it's intentional, but I think people are wanting to follow their procedures and their protocols. And sometimes you just have to kind of look at the big picture in terms of helping things to happen. And I think that's true of all bureaucracy. I've been in, uh, in, involved in bureaucracy when I worked for the state and I worked for Valencia County. Um, so I understand the nature of bureaucracy. And, and, and sometimes I think an outsider can come in and just make suggestions about how to facilitate the project and, and to just help usher it along. You know, private industry is going to do the, the, the development, right? They're the ones that are going to put in the money mm -hmm. and build it. Uh, but the county and the city both have to be uh, res available and responsible to the, responsive to the needs of, uh, of the business community to develop projects. But I think we also want quality projects. I don't think we just want any old project, any old place. I think we have to look at the, the location, the needs of the community, and, uh, and, and really encourage and, and assist in developing high quality projects for the residents of that community. What do you think is the most pressing need concerning the uh, county commission right now? Well, you know, one of my big concerns, uh, Diane, has been for a number of years, and it's a concern not just mine, but pretty much everybody in this community, mm -hmm. which is the issues of homelessness. My final job was that of a, of a prosecutor. My last job in my career of an actual regular full-time job was as a prosecutor. So it gave me a kind of a unique insight into what's going on with crime in, in this community and in this state because I was in Valencia County. And uh, there's a big connection, as you know, as everybody knows, between substance abuse and crime and homelessness. And so I think that's a big concern uh, for everyone in this community, but I think we want to go about it in a way that's effective um, And I've been trying to attend as many meetings as I can and to learn about the resources out there And what I would like to see and I know people are working on this, but I like to assist uh, developments of a comprehensive plan to address the substance abuse slash um, homeless slash crime issue You may be just to remind you, sure. just to let you know, sure. uh, Ted Gonzalez, who's going to be my guest on uh -huh. this program, perhaps you can meet him because he's working in a program that that kind of organizes five different nonprofits instead all right. of all the different people, uh, different organizations providing the mental health care and the substance abuse care and incarceration after car all these different things. It's a coordination effort that sounds like it's needed because. Uh, Frank Baca on this program, I do interview a lot of different people who are sure. having nonprofits helping with these issues, but are we even making a dent? And so maybe the coordination is needed. Um, what else is needed uh, in terms of the drug abuse, stopping the drugs at the border? What I mean, and again, I'm glad I asked you the question, what is the most pressing? Right. And you said the homeless and the crime and such. Well, that's my most pressing concern as well. Right. So I'm glad to hear it's yours, but you have a position to do something about it. What really can the county commission do 
other than listen and know that we are all concerned here in our beloved state, right. city, and county. What really could you do? Well, I, I mean, we talked about the fact that the state does have money, money. that yes. we do not. And I've been attending the opioid settlement meetings. I've gone to two of those. The state has received about $127 million. The county, as you may know, Diana, generates uh, more than $30 million a year through their behavioral health tax. And then the state has this, you know, billions of dollars in new money. So I think it's become not a question of money anymore. I think the question is having programs that are effective, effective. and that they are accountable and not just receiving money, but accountable for showing results for the program. And I've met some really amazing people, both in government and in nonprofits, that are doing some great things. And I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. I think we have to identify those really good programs and then just be there to support them. But we do have to hold them accountable. But it starts with us, right? It starts with a person on the commission to hold themselves accountable, to making sure that they're aware of what's going out there, make sure that we are setting clear uh, expectations and measures that we yes. want to see them meet. Uh, but they, we have, it starts with us to, to put that burden on ourselves, and then we can expect you know, the nonprofits and the government employees to be also accountable for it. I love that term, accountable, Frank, because we know there's a lot of money, but I've known in government, I see it, is it just creating jobs, government jobs, growing, growing go jobs, paper pushers, or right. is there accountability in right. it? And, and, and I think that's important and, and to, to, to use that term and expect people to, to get things done and to show results for the work. But I, I've been impressed. And one of the things I'd like to do at some point in time and I'm working on as we speak is to prepare a, a letter of some sort or a little essay of some sort that talks about some of the programs that I've run across because I've become very encouraged and optimistic as a result of meeting people that are doing this good work. And I feel like I'm somewhat involved and informed, but I wasn't aware of some of these programs out there that are doing some amazing work. So I think that other people might feel the same way to know how many programs are out there doing good things that need support and 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 um and or maybe have, the coordination. Because yes, exactly. I like I said, I've heard exactly. about a lot of these programs. Exactly. I'm thinking, oh, they're doing that, they're all doing it. But again, I can't ask for accountability. How effective is it? And um but maybe that's something that you can think about, the coordination of all these different entities. That's a great word, coordination, because we have these programs and we have gaps. So let's figure out what is our strong points, what do we need, and that's where the comprehensive plan comes into. I think we need an inventory of what we have, the beds we have, the facilities we have, the programs, the counselors, and then let's make a list of what we need, how many licensed therapists do we need, how many beds do we need, how many facilities do we need, and let's have this coordinated plan to fill in the gaps. Um, and I think that, I think, you know, we're never going to have a perfect society, right? We all, we all understand that. But I think we can really make improvements in how we spend money and how we, if we coordinate our efforts and as part of a plan. Because if we have a plan, it doesn't matter who is the commissioner, who is in charge. Good if point. a plan is in place, the next person Good steps point. in and keeps... With all this money, and again, you mentioned this op this tax, I didn't know. I mean, the opioid settlement I had heard about, and of course I know from the oil and gas, we have all this money. But you said there's a tax here in the city... County. County. One-eighth of one percent behavioral health tax behavioral has been around health. since 2016, I believe, okay. and generates... Over thirty million dollars, I am advised. Yeah. So, sadly, drugs are robbing people of their lives. Right. It's affecting us with the crime, of course, but it's still sad because someone's robbed of their life. Of course. Do you think this money should go towards prevention, or we just have such a big problem with uh, prevention and education, or stopping them at the border, or, or introduction from the police? I mean, where should the money? Be invested. Of course, we have the people with the problem now. We need to treat them. Correct. But what about stopping the problem? No, I, I think you're right. All of the above uh, needs uh, our attention in terms of uh, treatment, but also prevention. And I think there are programs that can be initiated in the schools, you know, to do uh, some uh, discussion with kids. And and uh, and I, you know, I'm not an expert. What I tell people, I'm not an expert. And I'll never know what the experts know, but I'm willing to listen to yeah. them and take their uh, recommendations. I think you know we we all agree we need to do a better job of keeping drugs out of the the country, but but there's 
you know, the people are so creative. If, if they're not bringing it in over the border, they're going to set up a lab in, you yeah. know, here in, in, in Albuquerque, in a warehouse or something. And <laughs> I so think there's a TV show created about that. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I heard about that. <laughs> that, is, that is true. Um, we got two minutes left. What would you like to press upon to the viewers out there to know a little bit more about you, why you're running, what you hope to do? Well, I think the number one thing is that I, I feel that uh, uh, community engagement is so important because when I've attended those meetings, neighborhood association meetings, which I, there's some amazing neighborhood associations that people are doing, doing some great things, uh, these open neighborhood settlement um, uh, meetings that I've gone to, where they're taking, there's a lot of good ideas. And I just think that the idea is to engage the community, listen to them, but also to follow up and be responsive mm -hmm. in regards to the things that they raise. I think that we, we're not doing people, we're not, county government is, is really the eyes and ears of the community and, and the county commissioner is the eyes and ears of county government. So I think you really have to get out there. And I think if people feel that they're being listened to, uh, if you really engage them, I think they'll be more likely to participate. So that's really my mantra is, is engagement with the community. Uh, we're there to do a job. You have to be available. You have to listen, but you also have to um, expect people to do their job. And by doing that, people, I think, feel better about their community. That sort of engagement makes everybody feel... Give them a feel... little bit of hope, more hope. Exactly. Then it isn't insurmountable. Exactly right. It can right. be done. That's exactly right. So And it starts with you. It, it starts with the well, county commission. It, I mean, it starts with the, the neighborhood association and then the county commission exactly. and then to the city exactly. and then the legislature and then the state. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it we're all in this together. It starts with us. It's all, we're all in this together. It's a community thing. And, and, you know, my message is that I'll work with anybody to get things done. Left, right, middle. I don't care what party, green, red, blue. I'll work with them to get things done for the community. And I think that's what people want at this time. Frank Baca, thank you so much for all you've done uh, for our state and the various state agencies you've worked for and now what you're hoping to do in the County Commission. Well, thank Thanks again. Much, and we have invited all the candidates uh, from the Bernalillo County who are interested in participating in the issues and answers. They're welcome and we're giving them equal time. So thanks again, Frank Baca, for being a guest on the program and thanks KCHF TV for bringing you these programs. Uh, have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Issues and Answers with your host Diane Kinnewater is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. To comment on today's program or to purchase a copy of any Issues and Answers program, visit sunbroadcasting.org or call us at 505-345-1991.